So as part of the Dark Arts series, we're here in Loughborough, and I'm uh, talking to Dr. Mark Alfina here at Loughborough. Thank you very much for being a part of the Dark Arts series. You're very welcome. Uh, so we just have a few questions, and the first thing that um, I guess we'd like to know is, how did you get to Loughborough? What, what was your academic trajectory? Okay. So, um, well, I graduated in Italy. I worked for a number of years as a support worker, um, supporting people um, undergoing treatment for drug misuse or alcohol uh, misuse. And then I um, wanted to do a PhD, um, which is what I did. And that was in Italy. As I became interested in CA, I was reading all these amazing papers um, <laughs> written by people at Loughborough University. Mm -hmm. So in a way, uh, for many years, it, it's been my dream sort of place. Um, still quite, can't quite believe I'm uh, working here now. How it happened is that a few years later, I had a job to work with Ruth Perry at the University mm -hmm. of Nottingham. In the meantime, I had applied for a um, European Marie Curie uh, research fellowship uh, to work here at Loughborough and I was awarded it so that was my opportunity mm -hmm. to actually work here at Loughborough. Um, later on they advertised um, a lectureship and I applied for it and and I got it so that's that's what I'm doing now. Fantastic so you kind of ended up where you wanted to be at the beginning? Yeah that's great. I can say I'm in my dream workplace which is a very privileged thing to be able to say. So just to unpack that a little bit, you did mention that uh, you were interested in conversation analysis, particularly looking towards coming to Loughborough, but could you talk a, bit how, talk a little bit about how um, you specifically got interested in CA? Yeah, um, at the time when I started at PhD, uh, I was really interested in group interactions. Mm -hmm. um, I used to be a facilitator. Again, I was working with people undergoing treatment uh, for drug misuse and things like that and sometimes with accompanying mental health diagnosis. Um, I was really puzzled at how um, those interactions were, were kind of difficult and the dominant explanations amongst my colleagues and other practitioners was that um, clients are difficult, um, they don't understand things very well or they are being non-cooperative. So I guess as I started my PhD and I started um, reading about CA really. Um, I got fascinated at how we can put all those assumptions to one side for a moment and actually look at um, what happens in those interactions and how actually there are things that are pretty systematic and organized. Mm -hmm. What seemed to be a mess in a way started to look orderly and organized and I was fascinated in it. So you did your was it your PhD and postdoc at Verona? That right? That's right. And so you talked a bit about how CA was kind of a response to what practitioners were already doing. Could perhaps you talk a little bit about the uh, I guess EMCA community at Verona or, or maybe more broadly in that area? Yeah. I'm glad you said more broadly. Uh, the funny thing is that there, there wasn't anyone doing yeah. CA at Verona. Uh, I can see that I had probably guessed that. Um, I, I trained um, with a PhD supervisor who was interested uh, in qualitative research, a lot of it interview based and in phenomenological approaches. Mm -hmm which I'm really glad I had the opportunity to learn those, but I had to go beyond Verona and liaise with other people um, to start interacting with EMCA researchers. I had an opportunity uh, because um, Piera Margutti and Renata Galatolo had organised a series of lectures um, by Audrey in Bologna. I think mm -hmm. it was must have been 2008, I think. That's how I got to know them. And Piera Margutti was organizing data sessions in Perugia, which was quite a way away, but uh, it was certainly a, a stay over. But I did go several times, and, um, and so I had the opportunity to start talking to other 
to other people but um yeah um for good or for worse i am during my phd my same training was mainly self-taught <laughs> i guess that's that's the way it goes in most uh institutions i think yeah yeah i guess um so you've talked a bit about what your um phd was on around these sort of therapeutic um communities could you talk a bit about how you became interested in that particular area that, that what what your focus was on those communities yeah so therapeutic communities are uh, usually residential settings mm -hmm. so people have their treatment there uh, and rehab um, again recovering from things like drug or alcohol yeah. misuse um, so they are they very much look like total institutions uh, uh, not in necessarily in the pejorative sense of the word that a lot mm -hmm. of abuse is happening but in the sense that people are confined to it they are regulated in terms of when you get up when you have lunch and so on and so forth and and they live it as a community mm -hmm. um, so again uh, at the start I was really thinking about it as a practitioner why is it that these interactions are so difficult why are we getting all this what we used to think is a lot of resistance from, from clients, mm -hmm. for example. And, and later on, as I progressed through my studies, I started to become interested in it more from a sociological perspective. In a way, it's like a mini societies and there's lots of fascinating processes going on there. Um, one thing that um, I focused on for my PhD was complaints. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Surprisingly, in a way, or maybe not. I'm not sure. Uh, one thing that the clients engaged on a lot in these meetings was uh, they, they were bringing a lot of complaints about persons who were actually not in the community or in the group, mm -hmm. relatives, other social workers. And I guess I didn't know at the time, but um, what we what, what we know now, I know now from 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 the literature, is that complaints. They, they tend to want some kind of affiliation, empathic mm -hmm. yeah. support and things like that. And the funny thing is that uh, the, the staff members, the support workers were constantly reporting it. In various sorts of ways, they were never providing uh, what the clients seem, or, or these complaint stories were looking for in a way. And I started to understand that seemed to be one of the bases for um, why the clients and the support workers always seem to be on different tracks, misaligned as to what they were trying to achieve. And then I started trying to track the basis for, for this kind of misalignment, which seemed to have to do with a lot of organizational constraints or the particular therapeutic models that these workers mm -hmm. were trying to implement in their interactions with the clients. So, so your work had very real uh, practical implications for these organisations, which I'll get onto uh, a little bit later. Okay. But first I want to ask about, uh, I guess, the, the project that you worked on when you came to um, Nottingham, mm. so the, the Verdis project. Yeah. Could you talk a bit about what, what Verdis is? Yeah. So this is a, um, a conversation analytic research and, and training programme mm -hmm. led by Ruth Perry. Um, which focuses on supportive, palliative and end-of-life care. Um, the empirical basis for it is, um, is a corpus of recordings of interactions between patients, sometimes their family members and healthcare practitioners. It was recorded in, um, in an English hospice. Hospices are settings that provide support and care for patients um, with so-called terminal diagnoses such as cancers, cancer mm -hmm. but other types of diagnoses as well. Um, the program is has several streams to it, uh, focusing on decision making, empathy, um, interactions with companions, pain management. What I have been focusing on is how uh, patients and healthcare practitioners negotiate and start conversations about death and dying and the mm -hmm. feelings and the thoughts surrounding it. 
could you unpack that a little bit about the I guess the key findings from your specific strand within the Bears project? Yeah. So um, I guess what we have been focusing on is how uh, both patients and doctors or other healthcare practitioners initiate to talk about death and dying. And we have started to think about it in these terms. There seem to be specific social constraints in terms of how these kinds of conversations can be started. And both sides, say patients and doctors, face a set of dilemmas. So, for example, our patients very rarely introduce conversations or death and dying as a topic mm-hmm. in a very direct manner. Quite often they will start with um, some kinds of, of ambiguous utterance uh, or statements um, which can allude to death and dying, but they are not necessarily about it. For an example that comes to mind is a patient talking about the severe pain she's in and saying, I've really had enough. But it could be about the pain, it can also be about being alive. And later on in the conversation with the doctor, she unpacks that she's actually uh, tired of living and that she would rather die sooner rather than later. Um, for the doctors, they also face a strong dilemma where if you start a conversation about death and dying in a direct fashion, for example, by asking the patient whether they have any thoughts about it, they can end up upsetting people or raising a topic that is not welcome for everyone. If they don't do anything, just that they just wait for patients to raise it, mm-hmm. they, they might miss opportunities to give um, some people a chance um, to have that conversation. So how do they strike that balance? We were very lucky to work with very experienced practitioners, clinicians, um, and what they do sometimes, um, they will follow up on something that the patient has been talking mm-hmm. about. Um, for example, there is a patient in our data reporting that um, actually th- his brother mentions that the patient has a severe cough and gets a lot of pain and he panics. And then the doctor asks the patient in those moments when he panics mm-hmm. what's going through his mind at that time. He also makes this gesture. And, and from context, we know that what can go through your mind at those times is that you think, oh, I'm breathless, I can't breathe, I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. The interesting thing is that when doctors ask these questions, they don't suggest that there's a possibility. So what they seem to be doing is to create opportunities for patients to volunteer that topic, but they design in a way that the conversational mm-hmm. environment in a way that maybe makes it a bit more likely, in a way they they seem to nudge patients, uh, I'm borrowing from Liz Stoker here, uh, this expression, um, but they do it in a very subtle way. Um, this partly goes against some of the guidelines which seems to recommend, at least sometimes, that doctors are explicit, they use the D word, death or dying. Uh, the evidence emerging from our findings is actually that it is possible to have those conversations Mm -hmm. in a more subtle, nuanced kind of way. So coming back to that to that evidence and um, the previous ca- question when we talked about practical implications, yeah. would you be able to talk about some of the practical implications for I guess for the Verdes project? And, spe- um, and I particularly want to know about um, the Real Talk, um, is a project that's come out of Verdes. Yeah, uh, so Real Talk is a training mm-hmm. resource. Um, based on um, the data we collected and conversation analytic findings. Um, It is currently hosted on a website. What it consists of is is a number of modules uh, to help train um, healthcare practitioners and and students Mm -hmm. um, to manage certain activities in, in conversation with patients. At the moment, uh, 
it comprises two, two modules. One on um, in promoting conversations about death and dying, or giving patients opportunities to have those conversations. And they're based on the findings that I've just tried to summarize. Mm -hmm. Another one is on how uh, doctors respond to patients' questions about um, their life expectancy. How long have I left to live? Mm -hmm. um, and the module on pain management is, is currently being developed. So what communication skills trainers find better is a number of clips that they can play to their audience and they're accompanied by transcripts and learning points, which are not only based on our own research, but also from the broader CA literature mm -hmm. that we draw upon. What's distinctive about it uh, is this type of training package is designed for communication skills trainers who are not CA trained. Yeah. And the idea is to try and spread and apply CA-based um, findings and applications um, across the NHS, the National Healthcare System, and um, allied organizations such as hospices. It is free to use. Um, but people need to be registered. Yeah. It, it is based on patients and clinicians consent to use the clips in training. So what it's trying to do is to give uh, real life materials to people who are very much used to manage their training through role playing simulation mm -hmm. and made up scenarios, which can be great for some things, but we know that they are systematically different from yeah. um, from mm -hmm. from the real yeah. thing as well. Just, just <clears> on that, how, how have you found, um, I guess, s selling CA to um, these practitioners? Have, have, have they been very receptive to it as a sort of an empirically grounded thing to show what's actually happening in the real world? Or have they been a bit wary of, we're not doing what we normally do? The, um, they have been very receptive of it and I think they, they really appreciate um, a couple of, of things about it. One is um, the, the realness of the mm -hmm. approach, uh, so looking at real cases which can be uh, a bit messier than made up examples yep. where everything goes according to some kind of script but those messier com complicated situations it was what they deal with on, you know, on an everyday basis. Another thing that um, they appreciated is that um, we helped, um, so let me restart this, um, I guess some training, um, some communication skills training is designed in such a way as to give people skills and tell them what to do. Our approach is bottom up, so we start from what experienced practitioners do, but maybe we help um, people find the language to describe what they do in the practice and they don't necessarily have it. They're very much immersed in that practice. Mm -hmm. So they don't necessarily take the time to stop and give a name to what they're doing. Um, and that's something from the feedback from people who've been exposed to the resource and used it, that that's been very helpful to them. and and validating at the same time, like, oh, okay, what I do is, is useful, is, mm -hmm. is meaningful. And another thing is that um, our approach, in a way, is to ask um, what's happening here? Why, why that now? Um, and so in training, um, people who use real talk um, you know, it's like when you're in a data session and people start making a lot of complicated assumptions on why people are doing certain things, what the motivations are, what's the psychology behind it. So it's about taking them back to what's happening in the attraction and what did you see, what did you hear, what happened here. Um, and that's also something that from the feedback we gathered, um, is appreciated. That's, and that's uh, very nice to know that uh, people are receptive to CA methods. Um, I guess I want to step away from mm. the practical implications and go back to 
the coral research findings from from these from this uh, Verdis projects. Yeah. Uh, so he recently co-edited a special issue on death and dying with Ruth Parry yeah. in patient education and counselling. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit to that special issue. What what um, what key findings could you summarise from the breadth yeah. of papers in that issue? I guess yeah. In the editorial, we try to provide a, a quick overview mm-hmm. of um, pioneering studies in conversations about death and dying, and and some important studies that had been conducted by Liz Holt, um, Maynard, um, Ansi Peracula, and a few others. And I think we took those studies to suggest that there that may be a social organisation to talk about death and dying, um, which maybe has something in common with talk about personal troubles more broadly. Mm-hmm. What we know uh, is that it's not stuff that people just introduce um, out of the blue. They work their way up to them and also leaving this kind of talk and closing it off uh, is a delicate thing to do. And particularly the studies have documented these stepwise questioning strategies where you start giving patients opportunities to talk about things but without naming that thing, which seems to manage matters such matters as who owns the experience and who's accountable for starting a certain kind of topic. So the studies in the special issue advance this area of research. For example, um, there's, a, there's a publication by Shaw, Chloe Shaw and colleagues, mm-hmm. who uh, extends this research to questions that psychotherapists use with patients who have terminal diagnosis, and she, they also show how this, this is done in a stepwise fashion. Mm-hmm. Another important theme that the special issue um, speaks to, I suppose, is what I mentioned earlier in terms of guidance saying we must be explicit. We are, you know, there's a taboo around death and dying. We don't talk about it. We are ambiguous about it. Patients do not understand us. And there's a um, study by Eckberg and mm-hmm. colleagues showing that people uh, have conversations about death and dying in clinical encounters without ever using the the word, but they still understand one another, and that's based on on context and the particular mm-hmm. design of certain terms in the sequential environments. So they unpack that. Um, another important theme is that in some clinical environments, uh, conversations about death and dying seem to be avoided. Mm-hmm. There's a study by Cortez and colleagues uh, on oncology consultations showing that oncologists sometimes um, use some kinds of conversational devices that help them um, avoid or make less likely to happen um, talk about the implications of scan results. They quickly transition into or what are the options for treatment here whereas the alternative could be to have a conversation about okay, what do these scan results mean? The current treatment is not working. And that's where people talk about an elephant in the room, for example. Mm -hmm. What does it mean in terms of how long is this patient going to live, maybe? Um, There's also, finally, a study by Jill, focusing on the fact that actually, um, sometimes clinicians do use the D word. but interestingly, um, they do so when they are not trying to promote a conversation about death and dying and the feelings and thoughts around it, but when they're making treatment recommendations. Things like, if you don't have chemotherapy, um, you might die. So something that I think comes from these studies is that if we want to understand how people use certain words, why they use them, well, we need to look at the activity they are involved in uh, and the particular sequential environment in which that happens, which is something that is overlooked in other kinds of healthcare communication literature. I guess that speaks to um, CA as being uh, 
a powerful tool to get at these particular issues. Um, yeah. Kind of without needing to justify why you're using SEER to look at these particular things, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, coming back to sort of moving away from research again um, mm-hmm. to, to how things work in the academic world. Um, so you've worked on Verdis with Ruth and then you've co-edited the special issue with Ruth. Could you talk about talk a little bit about um, the benefits of regularly collaborating with somebody and having these uh, great interpersonal relationships? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I think it's an interesting one. We started off, Ruth and I, as um, clearly she was my PI. She employed me to work as a research fellow on her project uh, right when she was starting this program of, of research um, and later on uh, our um, relationship evolved to be uh, collaborators and friends so I think um, it really works and it's great to have a collaboration of that kind I certainly consider Ruth as one of my main mentors and um, For me personally, um, it's been the opportunity to to develop myself and learn a lot of things. So uh, clearly, Ruth is not just a strong CA person. She also has a number of skills that I don't have, um, a very strong clinical background, which has been helpful for me in terms of understanding the context of uh, of the Mm -hmm. conversations we are studying but also how to address a clinical audience, what the language is. Um, You can't just go out there and talk about TCUs. That's pretty obvious. I'm I'm saying a platitude here, but um, how do you get that language right? How do you design training resources? Mm -hmm. Requires an understanding of what clinicians are looking for, how they make sense of things. Uh, and that's also something I've been able to learn from from Ruth. So I think I can speak for both in terms of both of us wanting to carry on <laughs> and to work together. I think we are both passionate about CA and its applications and we both enjoy with engaging with other CA people and and again being a doctor. Uh, is a great opportunity to do it. I guess uh, um, it is quite nice that you're both at Loughborough now and able to work on this together. That's quite right. Nicely. Um, I guess coming back to Loughborough, so you've been here for four years now, is that right? Yeah, uh, that's right, yeah. Um, so how have you found, I guess, DAG and the EMCA community at Loughborough? I mean, you mm-hmm. talked at the beginning about this is the place where you wanted to be, but... <laughs> Is it actually the uh, the dream that you thought it was? <laughs> I think it Maybe is. I mean, in a strange way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it is. I mean, um, uh, again, I trained as a PhD student in an environment where there weren't such resources as data mm-hmm. sessions, yeah. workshops, and you know, having colleagues down the corridor who you can ask things like. You know, what's the prosody of this turn or things like that? Um, it's such a great opportunity. Um, it's a very nice community. Uh, it's nice to have meetings and data sessions every week, getting feedback on my own work and learning about what others are doing and, and learning from their skills. Um, and being here, I mean, it's a privileged place to be uh, also for the teaching side of things. For example, I get to translate some of my understandings of communication mm-hmm. that are coming from my CA background yeah. into undergraduate and postgraduate teaching. So at the moment, I can really only think of the benefits of being here. That, that, that's perfectly <laughs> okay. Um, I, I guess there is more to Loughborough than just being a DAG, it is the whole community and everything that it, I guess it has to offer is, is kind of what uh, you're saying along those lines. Yeah, 
and the the, 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 the ability to just draw on someone uh, just down the corridor for an answer of what, what's what's this doing? Why is this happening now? Mm. Um, Plus all the academic tradition, mm -hmm. I guess, and the knowledge has been generated that that's done to us from previous generations of academics who have worked here, maybe retired or moved on to mm -hmm. other to other universities. So um, it's great to be here for that as well. Um, we are also lucky to be a little bit of a center of gravity. So there's people visiting and bringing their knowledge and, and we can exchange ideas uh, with them. Uh, for example, the wor wor workshops we organize we have people coming from other places. So it, 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 we are very lucky to be here in a way that sometimes you, you have to travel so much uh, just to be exposed to ideas and methods around CA. So I guess there's that as well. Mm -hmm. Plus the, the community of PhD students that we are lucky to engage with as well. I guess thinking about um, moving forward and what the future holds for, for I guess specifically for you and your research um, do you have any other projects that are starting to happen or that you're thinking about um, or are you maybe more work, still working on the Verdis and taking that uh, forward yeah so um, a couple of things here yeah. one is I'm, I'm doing more work on the Verdi's hospice data, particularly with Vicky Land. Mm -hmm. We're working quite a lot at the moment on um, so-called cues. Uh, it's a big topic in healthcare research and healthcare communication research and training where they say um, quite rightly that practitioners need to pick up on patients' emotional concerns Patients are often not very explicit about it. They they say ambiguous things. Uh, these are called cues, mm -hmm. and and you as a practitioner, you need to pick up on it. Uh, now, to our knowledge, um, there's a lot of assumptions about what is a cue. But has anyone done um, some work trying to demonstrate whether and how um, participants in the interaction treat something as a as a cue? and we have CA, so <laughs> that's what we are trying to look at um, and to tap into that debate and maybe help respecify the concept of cues. Um, another strand of research, uh, I've always been interested in support groups and mm -hmm. in the last couple of years I started working um, with a charity, Cruise, and recording some of their meetings. Um, Could you explain what Cruise is? So they support uh, bereaved persons. So it's bereavement support groups. People who have uh, suffered a loss. Yeah. This is a friend or a family member, partner, um, and lost them to death. Um, so I'm currently in the, in the process of um, I'm working with Mark Alexander. Uh, design a new real talk training module based on emerging findings on the strength of research. So I'll be doing more work on bereavement support and we'll be also mm -hmm. applying for, for a grant to hopefully collect more data. Yeah. But that's another And thing. if people wanted to find out more about real talk, where, where could they find this or how could they get in touch with you? Yeah, uh, so people can email me. I wish I had the address of the website That's at the okay. top of my we'll head, in the, uh, but there's the a real there's a real talk there's, there's a, a real talk website uh, and everything except for the video clips is um, is open access so the tr written training mm -hmm. materials and all that and uh, people can get in touch with me as well. Thank you so much uh, for the interview. You're welcome.